everybody, and welcome to Check It Out, the monthly show about what's happening at the Bethel Park Public Library. I'm Mary Mullen. I'm Elaine Volpe. And we're here today to talk about what's happening in June, right, at mm -hmm. the library. That's right. Uh, do you want to Shall I go first? Um, before, before we begin talking about the programs, I think we should answer a question that we have, right? Yes, that's right. If, if you watched our show last month, you know that Miss Elaine and I did play the game. We played fact, fact or fiction. Fact or fiction. And one of the questions that uh, Elaine asked me whether it was it fact or fiction was, did Vincent Van Gogh sell only, or how many paintings, or did he sell only one painting during in his, his lifetime. lifetime? And I said, oh no, that was fiction, but, in, but it was surprisingly a fact. A fact. And so Miss Elaine and I were going to sort of have a contest about who would get the answer, which painting did Vincent Van Gogh sell? And I confess, I cheated. <laughs> Actually, our esteemed director, Dave Cable, <laughs> emailed me the answer. And so I have the answer so to win. the name of the <laughs> one painting that Vincent Van Gogh sold during his life. And I believe we actually invited the audience. To, yes. Did you get any responses? I did not. Okay, I, did not I think we should do this again in the future. And, um, I and challenge our viewers to do a little research. And you can come to the library and do the research. We'll even I help. Agree. I don't know. Okay. Here is the answer. The name of the painting that was sold, the one painting he sold, was The Red Vineyard. And uh, according to the information that Dave sent me, he painted it in 1888. It was sold two years later, and it was purchased by a woman named Anna Bach, and she bought it at an art exhibit in Brussels. And she hung this painting in her home. On her ground floor of her home, she had her Salon de Musique, her music salon, and she apparently mm. was a fairly well-known art collector, had many famous paintings in her home, and people would come to her home for concerts, music concerts, and admire her paintings. Now, she sold That's the painting. Yeah, she sold the painting in 1906. It has been suggested she sold the painting because she was an amateur painter herself and was intimidated by the Van Gogh. Ooh. She felt it was blocking her creativity. So she sold it to a Russian textile manufacturer who also was an art collector. He had 58 Picassos on his wall. Wow. Wow. He, he, and a lot of other impressionistic paintings. And unfortunately, he lost his art collection after the Russian Revolution in 1918 because the, the state came in uh -huh. and appropriated all of his artwork. And... Um, and eventually all of his artwork went into different museums. So if you want to see the Red Vineyard, you need to go to the Pushkin Museum in Moscow in order to see the one painting that Vincent van Gogh sold. And in fact, this painting and one other painting in the world are the two most valuable paintings in the world. Is that right? Now, what do you think is the other most valuable painting? What other painting do you think would get the most money if it happened to be sold? Very famous painting, Mona Lisa. the Mona Lisa. That's that is exactly correct. Those they, some people feel these are the two most valuable paintings in the world if they were sold, which is of course highly unlikely. Unli highly yeah. unlikely, and who the heck could afford them right. anyway? I would say, what would it sell for? What would the... it sell for? Probably millions, and millions <laughs> of dollars. So, hmm. so I think very we, interesting. I, I, I indeed think we should continue this. I, I think will bring fact or fiction next uh, yeah, next, next, next time. And this time, we want our viewers to kind of play along with us. Yes. And I won't cheat next time. Okay. I, I won't Shame cheat. you, Mary. What'd I you know. That surprises me about you. Well, <laughs> it was pretty easy cheating no. when Dave yeah, came. Yeah, I'm I'm not really putting the blame on you. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, why okay. don't you talk about some what's going on in the children's okay. department? In, in last June. show, I did mention a lot of the upcoming things for summer reading, so I'm not going to go into detail, but I do want to just recap what's coming up in June. And one of the biggest things that's going on in June is our kickoff summer reading carnival, scheduled for June 11th mm -hmm. from six to eight. We invite all families to come out. It doesn't matter what age your children are, just come on out and have fun because I think we have a little something for everyone. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have a duck pond and some carnival games and some inflatables and some refreshments, of course, and um, what else? Something called Boom Blasters, which is a different, a different kind of game that's a lot of fun. And also the Scholastic Book Fair will be here open that week. 
So a good day to come on out and have some fun with us. Oh, and Mickey the Clown will be here face painting and doing some balloon art. Well, you do have a lot of fun things. Oh, that we have day. a lot of things planned. And it's free. Everything's free, except if you choose to support the book fair, obviously, or um, you know, purchase refreshments, we are going to be selling those. But everything else is entirely free. Okay. So and that's our kickoff event. Then on Friday, June 17th, we have our family scavenger hunt. It's been very popular the last couple mm -hmm. of years, so we want to do it again. This year it's going to take place all in the library. Okay, mm -hmm. in years past, sometimes you had to bring things from the outside, mm -hmm. or we had you travel around mm -hmm. Bethel Park. The whole scavenger hunt is going to take right, right here in the library, um, and you're just going to have to find different things. And because the theme is uh, one world, many stories, we're going to have some maps up, and you might have to do some, you know. Test your geography skills and, yeah, your map, map, map skills. Map reading skills. Right. And, um, yeah, it's just fun for the whole family, and there will be prizes for first, second, and third place. Right. So we're looking forward to that. So that's coming up in June, and then all of our other programming starts, too. These flyers are now available upstairs at the children's desk, and they are also going home on the schools, and they are posted on our website. Okay. So the information is out there. You just need to find it and start marking your calendar. Decide what you want to do. Teen program. Um, Runs, it starts that same week, mm -hmm. and we have 10 programs coming up for teens, too, that we're really excited about. So I just thought, because I went into detail last week and I didn't want to, like, reiterate what I had already said, I just thought maybe I'd talk briefly about the importance of summer reading and why it's so important that we mm -hmm. encourage our kids to read over the summer. Because how many times do you hear? I mean, it's every kid's thought process, I think, well, I just got out of school. I just went to school for nine months. I'm not reading. And surprisingly, I think that's a lot of the parents' philosophy, too, as well. You know, they were reading all throughout the school year. I'm going to give my kids a break. Mm -hmm. And while I'm a huge supporter of, you know, exercise in the outdoors and getting out in the summer, I also still feel very strongly about reading. And I'm not talking about reading, you know, for a whole afternoon, like sitting aside and sitting inside reading a book for a whole entire afternoon. I'm talking about 15 minutes a day. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you do it at the breakfast table while you're eating your cereal. Maybe you do it while you're at the pool when you take a little swim break. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe you do it in the evening before you go to bed. But just 15 minutes, which really isn't that long at all, makes a huge impact, a really big difference on the reading skills that you're going to retain. There's a such thing, um, studies have shown, they're calling it the uh, summer reading loss. Mm -hmm. um, that if you don't read at least 15 minutes a day, that you do indeed lose these reading skills and that you fall behind in the fall. Mm -hmm. um, you often hear teachers talking about how when they get school starts back up again in September or late August, whenever it starts, that a lot of the beginning part of the school year is really just is review because reviewing the kids are losing it because they those skills have not been maintained. That's right, and it's a cumulative type of thing. So I, I don't think it's you know if you're thinking well they'll catch up in the fall, they really don't catch up. They are going to be behind mm -hmm. because studies have shown for those kids that have chosen to read you know 15 minutes a day or so many books during the summer, they are significantly ahead of those kids who didn't. Mm -hmm. So you know, and it's surprising I guess when you think about because really like three months makes a difference, but it really does. Mm -hmm. So. It's and just and very, think, very important, not for the reading skills, but your writing skills and spelling, just so much. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we don't really want kids to have an idea that reading is only associated with school and school work. We, you want exactly, to, and that was another good point that I'm going to bring up. You know, I have a reluctant reader myself. I, I meet reluctant readers all the time, kids mm -hmm. who just don't enjoy it. Um, but the thing with the summer, and especially here at Bethel Park, we're really lenient. If you join our summer reading program, we're really lenient as far as what you can read. You know, a lot of libraries and even some parents put a stipulation on it, like, well, you have to read a book that's at least 300 pages long. We don't. Um, you know, you can pick up a graphic novel, read that, and have it count. Mm -hmm. Pick up a magazine, and as long as you read it from front to cover, you can count that. Mm -hmm. I mean, anything counts as long as you're reading 15 minutes a day. But um, that was a good point because I think a lot of kids associate it with school and a lot of times they don't get to choose what they're reading in school. Right. It's assigned to them. Mm -hmm. But the nice thing about the summer is you can come here to the library and pick out anything. anything I mean, a nonfiction book on a topic that interests you or a fiction book on, you know, by an author that you choose. Mm -hmm. um, and there's just so much to choose from. And don't forget, um, audience members out home, that we have audiobooks now. We have playaways. We have so much more. You don't you know, just have to... Mm -hmm. Pick up a book. You can pick up a play away and listen to a book. And maybe I don't know. Maybe some can, kids are already having getting access to the to the Kindle. To the Kindle, Kindles. right? You can download books. Download a book to your listen to, to your it in the Kindle. car, or listen to it at the pool, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, a lot of options out there. I just really want to encourage everybody to sign up. 
Um, and that little bit of reading every day is going to make a huge difference. And then we incentivize. Like we offer you great prizes just for reading. Just so right. there's no excuse not to come out and do it. That's right. So, and that's it. And just, uh, you know, we will reward your efforts in the end, too. We talked about the carnival, but we also have a swim party at the end at and the a end bowling party, party that everybody's invited to. So there's something to look forward to, too, yeah. if you do Sounds participate. Sounds like it's going to be a lot of, lot of fun this summer. Fun. Absolutely. Okay. Well, since we've talked about uh, the children's summer reading program, I thought uh, we'd talk a little bit about the adult summer reading program because we don't want the kids to be the only ones that have fun during the summer. We do have an adult summer reading program which will begin on Monday, June the 13th. That will be our first day. And you can register for the program here at the library or online. And it, it works, it's very similar to the kids program. You can uh, submit an entry for every book you either read or listen to. But we, we do put a few stipulations on ours. <laughs> no newspapers or magazines. And your entry then qualifies you for the weekly drawing, which will be a $20 gift card to a local business. And then all of your entries will qualify you for the grand prize, which what is the grand prize this uh, year, I Mary? I don't think we know yet. Oh, it's Rob's a keeping it a surprise. It's Rob's keeping it a big surprise. So, uh, and you can you can submit your you can register online. Mm -hmm. You can also submit your entry online too. So even if you can't come to the library, but of course, as always, we hope you do come to the library. So, um, and the theme for the children's summer reading program has, is World, One World, Many stories. stories. And then for the teen, it's um, You Are Here. You Are Here. Now, for the adults, it's called Novel Destinations. And I thought that was a great theme for a library mm -hmm. because, of course, a library itself is a destination for, right. for novel, novel readers. And I brought along a book that I wanted to share with our viewers. And this book is called Book Lust to Go. It's an interesting title. It's an interesting <laughs> title. And it is written by a woman named Nancy Pearl. And Nancy Pearl, and I'm sure this is very hard for everyone to see, but Nancy Pearl is sort of the librarian's librarian. And she actually has her own action figure. Did you know the library? I did not know that. Did so you I saw know this that? The <laughs> library, yes. Librarians have. Does she do something? What is this button? Well, in the yeah, back? she. Mine is not working. Yeah, she does. Actually, yeah. you know, this with fig, little action figure was a little controversial when it first came out because she is sort of shushing, 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 and people said that's a very stip, stereotypical portrait of a librarian. But Nancy's like she's. She has a good sense of humor, and she thought it was all tongue in cheek and a lot of a lot of fun. Of course, we don't shush anymore. No, in, I was going to say in the in, in the library. But uh, um, as I said, Nancy has written uh, several books, uh, and the fun thing about her books is that if you love to read, her books are a collection of book lists. And one of the fun things that she likes to do is to give interesting subject headings to her book list. And I opened this one up. This book, Lust to Go, which is recommended readers reading for travelers, vagabonds, and dreamers. Hmm. So this is all travel, travel books, of course, very appropriate for this year's theme. And I was looking through the list in the index of her subject headings, and I came across this one, Row, Row, Row Your Boat which is the pretty soon is going to be our way of getting around if it does not <laughs> stop right. raining. <laughs> so I started reading and I came across a couple of interesting titles and this is actually her suggestions, believe it or not, for all for books on rowing. Hmm. And the first one is called A Pearl in the Storm, How I Found My Heart in the Middle of the Ocean. And this is a book about by Tori McClure, who was the first woman to row solo across the Atlantic Ocean. So there we have a little bit of armchair traveling, uh, arm, armchair adventure. And then her another one that su she suggested that I have recommended to somebody who liked it very much was called Down the Nile, Alone in a Fisherman's Skiff by Rosemary Mahoney. And Rosemary Mahoney was a woman who decided that she wanted to row down part of the Nile River and she was actually able to achieve this goal. And the, I thought the two books were an interesting contrast because Tori McClure had the physical dangers mm -hmm. of 
rowing across the Atlantic. For Rosemary Mahoney, it was a different kind of challenge. She had to, the psychological challenges of being a Westerner and a woman at, right. who wanted to row down the Nile. And she had a lot, real tough time getting this adventure started because nobody wanted to sell a rowboat or a skiff uh, to a woman in Egypt. So, but she was, she, she was able to find somebody that sold her a boat. But the man that sold the boat to her insisted that he had to follow her behind in another oh, boat. Is that right? He, I don't know if he was he, he was trying to protect her or he just was curious about what right. was she was she was. How up old to. was she when she accomplished? Uh, you know, that's a good question. Um, I don't know how old Rosemary Mahoney is, but uh, the book is fairly new. It just came out just a couple years ago, and as I said. Um, one of my homebound patrons really enjoyed it. So, um, so if you if you think you would be interested in, in taking perusing the interesting book list in Nancy Pearl's book book list to go, it is available uh, through the system. And as always, a reminder to everybody: you know, if there's a book that you hear about, if you're at home and you're listening to, mm -hmm. to the radio or television, you hear about a book and you, you want that book, and you want that book right away, give us a call, right? Because we will Absolutely. We'll put a reserve on it um, as, soon as, as soon as we can. And the sooner you call us, the sooner, okay. you, the sooner <laughs> you get your book. So let's talk a little bit about um, other programs in sure. June. You know, June, you know, you usually think about summer reading as being sort of the lighter kind of reading, beach reading, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about our June programs is we've got some sort of heavy going, heavy, du heavy duty topics in our June programs. And I don't know how that <laughs> happened. I really don't, but they're interesting ones. Um, I want to talk first of all about our movie night, which is m Sunday, not Monday, Sunday, June the 5th. This will be our last movie night until the fall. And we have a really interesting movie. It's called Departures. And this movie won the Academy Award in 2009 for the Best Foreign Film. And it is a movie made in Japan. And it's a story of a Japanese cellist whose orchestra disbands. He returns to his hometown to find another job. And he answers uh, an ad for a job, for a position. And he thinks it's for a travel agency. And it has, apparently it has departures in the ad. Well, as it turns out, it has nothing to do with travel. What he ends up doing, it becomes an encoffineer, which is a term for somebody that prepares a body for burial. Oh my. Now, it sounds, that sounds sort of grim. It does. <laughs> it does. But um, the reviews for this movie have been glowing, and somebody described it as the sweetest and gentlest movie about death that you could ever imagine. Wow. And apparently in Japan, this is a ritual ceremony that is performed on people who have passed away. Hmm. So we that can me this. I don't know if I can come that day, but, but I'll have it, to run it, it just, on my own. Uh, it's just sounded like a um, an, a really interesting mm -hmm. movie, um, very life affirming mm -hmm. actually, and, and about the value uh, and dignity of each human life. So that's departures on Sunday, June the fifth at six o'clock, and then also another. Um, kind of challenging program we'll be having is called Closure 101, and this is going to be another Lunch and Learn. This is on Wednesday, June 15th at noon time. So you bring your lunch and um, enjoy a speaker. And this presentation is um, about end-of-life care planning. And it's a new program developed by the Jewish Healthcare Foundation. And it's designed to give people very simple, basic, easy to understand information mm -hmm. and resources about a topic that most of us do not want to address, right? Right. We, we certainly do not. This is one that we don't, do not want to think about. But of course, it's a, a very important topic. So join us for Closure 101, Lunch and Learn, on Wednesday, June 15th at noontime. We have some health-related programs coming up also in June. Again, these are some 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 tough 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 topics. Um, although the first one is, I think, will be of interest to a lot of people. Do you take any uh, any I supplements? I don't take daily supplements. No. Okay. I don't, and I don't give vitamins to my kids either. But I know a lot of people who do. My mother takes daily vitamins. Okay. Um, Right. So, I don't know, what are you going to tell me about this? Should I be taking? Well, that's what this program is all about. This is learn the ABCs and omega-3s of supplements. 
And Part of the reason I don't take them is because I'm not a good pill taker. Okay. Never right. been a good medicine taker. I can't. Well, I think a lot of people feel that way. Yeah. yeah. People are reluctant right. I think, to take things. And I, I'm one of those two. I have to say, I do take one because my doctor recommended it to me, and I would not have taken it unless she hadn't, hadn't recommended it to me. But if you have questions about whether or not you should be taking any supplements, and what you should be taking. That is interesting. So if you're a healthy eater, do you really need the supplements? Well, my doctor... You know, if you're getting plenty of your mm -hmm. folic acid and iron and everything else through your diet, do you really need the supplements? Okay. Or are they recommended for everyone, regardless uh, well, of their diet? Well, I, I, I know my doctor told me as long as I, I felt I was a pretty healthy eater, and she said, well, if you feel that way, then you should don't need to take a, mm -hmm. a, a multivitamin. But I know a lot of I've also heard a lot of doctors say right. that everybody, everybody right. should be taking one. So, so obviously, if that's we right. have questions, that's right. We can <laughs> assume that other people have questions too. So that program mm -hmm. is Thursday, June the 9th at seven o'clock, and we also have uh, another program. Don't let colorectal cancer kick you in the butt. That's an interesting <laughs> title. And uh, but this is of course presented by the Allegheny County Health Department. Another serious okay. topic. And we also have a program in June on breast cancer. For more information about times and dates uh, about these programs, just give us a call at the library. Our Wise Walk program is continuing through June. Please let it not rain on Thursday mornings <laughs> when I might clear up by then. I think I know it's thunderstorming today and into. No, I they tell calling you, for rain they're tomorrow. They're calling too. for rain all morning well, tomorrow, so we may have to move inside, which is always a disappointment for my wise walkers because yeah. we do prefer to walk outside. But you can join Keep the wise walk pressed. at any time. Our program will run all through June, and our art class demonstrations will be going through June too. And uh, one of them will be a watercolor demonstration. That's on June 14th. And the other one is called Lynn's Contemporary Headshots Demo. This is actually going to be on the Thursday before Father's Day. And it gave me an idea. If you're looking for uh, a Father's Day gift, what the artist is going to do is she is, you should, be, if you come to the program, you should bring a photograph of a loved one. And since it's Father's Day, a picture of your dad yeah, and preferably a, good, a headshot, idea. headshot. She's going to select a photograph and then use that for her demonstration and then give it to the person. Excellent. So I thought that would be make a great opportunity for you to, to um, give your dad uh, a sure. gift and how nice a picture of himself. <laughs> so that's wonderful. Thursday, June 16th at 6 o'clock. So, and as always, if you um, need some more information about any of the programs at the library, you can give us a call. You can, of course, click on our website. And or, better yet, come on in and see us in person. Come on in. We'd, lo we'd love to see you. Uh, stay tuned. Check it out. We'll be back. Hello, this is Nancy Meyer and I'm a resident of Bethel Park. Did you know that our wonderful community is 125 years old this year? Well, it is, and we're searching for that person who has lived here longer than anyone else. We have lots of activities going on over the next few months, and we'd like to honor that special person who has lived here continuously for the longest period of time. Just come up to the library and look for the flowered box on the circulation desk. Give us your name, the date you moved here, and your contact information. You can nominate yourself or nominate someone that you know. I'll be calling you to let you know how we will honor you as our very special resident. And please watch for information about all the other special activities that are going to be coming up in our community over the next few months to celebrate our 125th anniversary. Welcome back to Check It Out. 
And as our viewers can see, we are, Check It Out is on location today, and we have a very special guest. I'd like to introduce our special guest. Uh, for those of you who come into the library on a regular basis, I'm sure you'll recognize the very friendly face of my coworker, Barbara Connell. Welcome to Check It Out, Barbara. Thank you, Mary. I uh, appreciate you inviting me today. Oh, I'm delighted to have you here. And Barbara <laughs> and I are going to talk about uh, our favorite topic, right? Yes. <laughs> Which is books and reading. And I thought this location would, would be the perfect destination for our little chat about books and reading because as you remember from the earlier part of the show, the theme for the adult summer reading this year is novel destinations. And I think we are at the perfect destination for anybody that loves books and reading. We are in the newly renovated courtyard outside the Bethel Park uh, Library and Municipal Building. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the courtyard renovation at the, at the end of the show. Let's talk a little bit about what you do here at the library. Okay, my main, um, well actually I work for the circulation department, work at the circulation desk. I often put books away and other materials, but my main job is the delivery, which comes in from the other libraries and these are items that people have requested mm -hmm. and um, along with my sweet coworker Jess mm -hmm. we sort everything that comes in it comes in in big huge bins we sort it into um, various categories we mm -hmm. s scan everything okay. put on the names and the date that's mm -hmm. a week from that day and we put everything in alphabetical order on the hold shelf and then the people get notified automatically through an automated system mm -hmm. and then they come and pick up their things hopefully okay. and we really enjoy that that's one way to find new books movies whatever mm -hmm. it's one of my many ways of, of oh, right. discovering new things that are that are mm -hmm. potential things that i would like to take out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah, I, th I always have thought that you did have one of the one of the best jobs at the library because oh. I've had that experience that sometimes being up in the front with you when the new books when mm -hmm. the when the bins we call them bins come in yes and I watch as you start putting them on the carts and I start I go, oh look at that look at that look at that I know and I know you get ideas for your homebound I, patrons I that do. way too which is really wonderful mm -hmm. and I just sometimes I'll see something that I didn't know existed for instance yesterday we got in a Someone had ordered a movie named Scanners. Okay. Yes. And I was going to say we had. We had yeah, we had a laugh about that because Jess and I had a joke that we were going to star in a movie someday called Scanner, and we never knew that there was a real movie. There is one. Yes. But looking at the cover of it, we did not think that we would want to be in that particular yeah, movie. Yeah, well, sort of, that cover was sort of like... It, it, was, it was a scary movie. It was a scary movie. And this is not scary. Okay. This is pure pleasure here. Okay. So. On, a, on a typical, on a, on a particularly busy day, uh, a busy delivery day, how many bins do you think we would get? I would say the most, this is just, you know, in my, in my time here, I think the most I've ever seen come in was 16. 16. Okay. Well, how, ma how, about, how many that, books in a... Uh, just a I, wish, I wish I had a counter on mm -hmm. me to count how many things we actually scanned. It has to be phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And yesterday we had 12. Mm -hmm. And it usually takes us a couple hours oh, to sure. accomplish this process, but it's very... Yeah, I, was trying I, know, to I find it to be very, very enjoyable. I'm trying to imagine how many materials are in each I know I wish we had like I said I wish we could just mm, have like 20? a little more than more than oh I would say and then depending on what they are like um, music CDs of course take up less space they, than, than bigger books yes yeah. and I saw some of the books that you get for the for the um, home, for the home bound are like coffee table type oh, books right. and they take up so depending on what's in there we have um, mm -hmm. it's a lot it's a lot it's and a it's lot it's and this is a good opportunity to remind our viewers that if our library doesn't have a particular item that they're looking for, we can get it from any of the 44 other libraries in the county. Plus, we can also request things from outside the county. So, right, right. Uh, we, will, we will not stop until we can see if we can get that right. item, item no, for it's you. It's amazing what they do. Even the things that aren't in the county, what the Interlibrary Loan okay. Department will go mm -hmm. through to get something for people. And they've come from interesting places, I find. I know. Too. Clear got, across the country right? at, at times. I've um, gotten them from military bases, churches, all kinds of mm -hmm. uh, all interesting. Universities. Universities. And, and, uh, sure. it's, it's great. 
Well, let's, um, let's talk a little bit about the books and the reading. You know, about twice a year, I send out an email to the staff requesting their recommendations. I usually do it about this time of the year, halfway through the year, and then at the end of the year. And I can always count on Barbara. Barbara's my go-to girl <laughs> for book recommendations, because I know you are an avid and passionate reader. I am. I, I sometimes feel like it's an addiction that I should be committed somewhere for, just because it's it's really so important to me that I feel like it's too important. Well, but, um, well I don't think it's too important. <laughs> <laughs> I do enjoy when you send those emails because it's usually pretty easy to mm -hmm. come up with things that I especially liked. All right, well, let's talk about your favorite books of 2011 so far. Okay, probably my favorite book so far is one of my favorite authors, Maeve Binchy, has a book called Minding Frankie. And the thing I love about her, she's an Irish author who always so charmingly, uh, I, I just love the way she puts words together. Mm -hmm. And she brings back characters from previous books in a way that's amazing to me. Mm -hmm. Like how she blends them all together and you feel like you're in Ireland for that little bit of time that you're reading that book. And just always, always love her style. Was she your favorite author for she, last year? The year before that. The year before that. The year okay. before that. She didn't have a, a new book last okay, year. Okay. <laughs> so, or she might have been. So, on, she might and have been one, of, one of my other favorite authors had a new book last year, and I haven't read it yet because I bought it. Okay. And since I bought it, it's sitting in this big, huge bookshelf with all these other books I haven't read because I keep taking books out of the library and... The books that I've bought are just waiting patiently, but mm -hmm. Ken Follett is another favorite of mine. Okay. And he had a book come out, um, fall, fall, I think. Fall, is it Fall of Giants? Yes. Okay. So I have that at my house, mm -hmm. sitting there, and it's pretty That's a big book. Pretty big, so I think, well, I'll read that someday. But I always can <laughs> count, I can count on him, too. And when you're talking about destinations, mm -hmm. I sometimes feel like I don't need to go on vacation because all these books take me to the places mm -hmm. and let me feel like I'm there for a while. I know uh, my husband and I saw uh, Ken Follett last fall at the book festival which was last September in Washington DC and I know he he talked about his new book The Fall of Giants. Yeah it had just come out it I just, believe. It just yes. had come out so yes. was, uh, I know my husband's waiting for it to come out in paperback because it's so heavy he says. Yes. He's got to have them in paperback. His, his it is it is heavy. I had gotten a gift card, so I didn't feel guilty for buying the hardback. Mm -hmm. So, What else have you read this year that you've enjoyed? Um, I would say there was a book I just recently read, and I can't say that it's going to be on my favorite book list, but mm -hmm. it was a book that was so compelling and well-written that I will always remember what happened in it. It's called Faith by Jennifer Haig. I've always read... I've read her other books. She has three other books. She's a very good writer. I feel like the books are very realistically written, mm -hmm. very well written. This particular one is about a priest who has been accused of molesting a child, and it's during that, I think it was 2002, it's a fictional account, okay. uh, 2002, that big Boston mm -hmm. fiasco, and it's written from the point of view of his sister who has found out the whole story mm -hmm. and it almost read like a mystery in the fact that it was like what's going to happen here mm -hmm. and there's things revealed as you go along that are that are surprising mm -hmm. and I think even though I would not say this is my favorite book I would say this is a book that's a memorable book mm -hmm. very compelling and it always drew me in okay. to the, the whole story mm -hmm. And I felt like I was in Boston. In Boston. <laughs> um, let's, since you mentioned faith, let's talk a little bit about um, places where you get book titles from. Because we found, um, we're looking at Oprah's magazine. You mentioned that yes. to me. Yes. And she has apparently a monthly column called The Reading Room. Right. And Faith was a book that was, it was it, featured in that in, column. In that column, and that's not actually where I found it. Okay. I think I found it on the library website. Sometimes I'll go in. The library website has a wonderful 
um, feature where you can go into the catalog. And sometimes I'll put in an advanced search okay. for fiction books mm -hmm. for the for the new year, okay. like books that are after 2010. Mm -hmm. And I'll just scroll through the list and I'll think that looks good. I also go to bookstores, okay. see things that look good, and I do judge books by their covers sometimes. Do you really? I do. I'll see a cover that looks so neat. Mm -hmm that I'll just have to pick that book up. Okay. And I've been led to some wonderful authors that way. I really have that method. It's not always tried and true, but it has led me to some great people. Um, I also get emails from Barnes and Noble and Borders, okay. and those lead me into books. Um, there's a website called fantasticfiction.com, okay, yeah. mm -hmm. which is a really great addictive mm -hmm. kind of website for me. Um, patrons, library patrons. One day I had a lady come in and she set down the book The Kite Runner. Okay. Now that's a book that takes place in Afghanistan, which is not a place that I would be necessarily attracted to, and I kind of hadn't given it a thought. And she was raving about the book, mm -hmm. and it didn't have any holds on it, so I thought, well, I'll take this out. And it was another very was memorable book, mm -hmm. as was his book, uh, A Thousand Splendid Sons. Mm -hmm. and I don't know how to pronounce his name. No, I don't but I, Or I would say it. Um, but that's another wonderful way. And the book delivery. Sure. You know, that gives me ideas. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think. There's a mm -hmm. lot of different ways to find good that, books. Too oh, many, actually. Too many. <laughs> that fantastic fiction. We'll talk a little bit about that, because that is a great website. It and, is. It is. I use that if I am trying to find books for my homebound patrons, and I'm trying to get books in order that they oh, were yes, written. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And that's an yes. important thing. For instance, uh, many authors write books in series, and sometimes um, I'm not sure what the newest book is, or right, right. the books right behind that. So I can go to Fantastic Fiction, you put in the author's uh, name, and then they show all of the books and they organize it. If the, if the author is a writer who writes in series, then they'll have the name of the series, then all of the books listed in order of publication, then they'll go to the next series. And you're right, it's, it's a great It is. Book. It's nice for me here, too, if I'm waiting on somebody and they'll say, I want to know what's next after this one. Mm -hmm. And you, There's also a library um, site that you can go to called Novelist, okay. which will also and I'm sure there's other places too, but those are two places that where you can do that order thing, which I find to be, because I like to read books in order. I figure even if it's a mystery and it goes into the, the central character's family life, mm -hmm. it's good to do it in a logical manner. The other thing about the fantastic fiction, because I thought it was interesting when you talked about the book covers, oh, because you know oh. you're right, a, a, a bad cover can be a real turnoff, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, people sometimes I think will look at a, a, a cover. I've, this is very true at the heart with the large print books. Oh, because often they will put, and I don't quite understand why they do that. They I put was a wondering that too. They put it when they publish it in a large print format. They put a different cover on it, and very often it, it's not a particularly attractive cover, and it puzzles me. I wondered why they did that too. I don't. I don't have the answer to that. No. At all. No. But the fantastic fiction does show the books with their, well, with, with with their, their covers, covers, yes. And you can get information. It's not just a listing of the books. You can get a description right, of right. what the book is about. And that is, a, that, is a tr that is right. I'm glad you mentioned that because that is a terrific, um, one of many terrific uh, oh, websites. I know. I know we talk <laughs> sometimes. Um, there is a book so uh, website from the American Booksellers Association. They have something called the Indie Next List. And this is a list of books that have been very popular in independent bookstores. So while Amazon and Barnes and Noble, I think, are also great, uh, well, I like Am I like Amazon uh, a lot. I love reading the customer reviews on Amazon. Oh yes, yes. Uh, but the Indie Next list is a list of books that independent booksellers are recommending, and also that they're people that coming into the store enjoy enjoy reading. In fact, I brought a copy of one. Let me see if I can find this. My longest. This is the current, this is May's list, and at least one of the books, they have a little description. I'm going to read this because this is a book that sounds, this is a brand new book that sounds kind of interesting to me. This is the story of Beautiful Girl by Rachel Simon. 
One stormy evening in the late 1960s, Martha, a retired school teacher living alone in her farmhouse, opens her door to find a young couple from the nearby state school for the incurable and feeble-minded on her doorstep, carrying a very new baby. Martha has time to feed and clothe them, and then they have time to locate a hidden space in the attic in which to hide the baby before the authorities appear. The man escapes, the young woman is led away, and the young woman tells Martha, hide her. And to her own astonishment, Martha agrees, agrees to keep the baby, and in that moment, readers give their hearts to these four remarkable characters and the story of their next 40 years of their lives. To me, that was, that was a description that really grabbed hold of me. I wrote that down on my to-read list. because And doesn't... I've seen that somewhere else featured. I don't know whether it was in the one of the bookstores, websites. It's been somewhere else, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's a book worthy of... Of, 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 adding, of, of, adding of adding to, to my million, uh, <laughs> our million on my list. <laughs> yes, Barbara and I have share something in common that my husband always pokes fun at me. I love to read books, but I love to read about books, and I have book lists everywhere. Me too. I have them organized in folders at home by topics and themes. I have book lists on this, but I mean, there's no way, right? We cannot. We will not. I know. We sometimes will not live long enough to read them I, all. I, I, that's what I'm afraid of. And sometimes I think if I only spent the time that I was making my list, actually yeah, reading I, something, maybe I'd get ahead of the game. Yeah, here. I do. I feel. But that it's one. fun. It is fun. It's fun. It's fun. It I'm never fun. running out of reading material. I feel bad when someone comes in and says. I don't have anything to read. <laughs> I, mean, that is, that's <laughs> I have the opposite problem, which is not a problem, but a wonderful, a wonderful thing to always have. Yeah, I am surprised too when people say, you know, I'm looking for something to read. I'm thinking, you're looking yeah. for something to read. Or when people say, I'm bored. Oh my gosh. And I think, I, I will never be bored. I can always entertain myself because of mm -hmm. the wonderful world of books. Let's, so. let's take a couple minutes to look at some of the other staff recommendations because I actually I got recommendations from several staff people and I'm going to um, kind of read and share some of the things they sent me um, from Dawn who works in uh, Dawn Hurley who works in our children's department Dawn recommended two books the first one is called Mountains Beyond Mountains by Tracy Kidder and I read an, another book by Tracy Kidder and I wish I could remember the name of it but this is uh, a biography of Paul Farmer, who is a specialist of infectious diseases and a doctor at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. And for more than 20 years, Farmer has spent part of each year in a hospital and health center that he founded in, in Haiti. And Dawn told me that since she's gone out on a number of mission trips herself, she could really re relate to this very inspirational story. And it's an example of a book that she loved. She borrowed it from the library, loved it so much, she started buying it, and in fact has bought multiple copies to, to give to other people. Mm -hmm. And the other book is one that's on my list. I don't know if you've read this book. Little B. Little B. Okay. I've had it out. Okay. And it was during one of these periods where I just was overwhelmed and I ended up bringing stuff back. So I've had it okay. in my house. <laughs> but it'll be down the road somewhere. I, I, I have the same thing. I actually yeah. found a copy on our sale rack. And we do oh, have a, yes. also, another good thing to talk <laughs> yes. about. We do have a sale rack. We actually have a book sale year round. We have our annual big book sale, but we have a small bookcase here in the library, our sale rack, and, and we sell books that are donated to us year round, 12 months a year. And I found a cop, paperback copy of Little B on there and I bought it. And it is on, on my to do, my to read list also. And this is the story, Little B by Chris Cleave, is the story of a British couple and a Nigerian orphan who calls herself Little B, whose lives become entwined after they have an encounter on a beach in Nigeria. So, again, a book that's by word of mouth, I think. Yes. A lot, there's a lot of, a lot of buzz about this book. So. Um, Beth Scarlett, who also works in our children's department, recommended a book I know that people were talking about. Have you heard about this I've book? heard about that. This is The Battle Hymn of the Tiger Mother, and this is by Amy Chow, and I hope I'm not mispronouncing her name. And this is not a parenting book, 
but more of a memoir, and I'm, I'm just going to read what Beth said, of how Mrs. Chow raised her children in the Chinese style of parenting instead of the more typical or Western style. And the book was very controversial when it was first published. Her two daughters were denied typical American fun. There were no sleepovers, no play dates, no crafts, no sports, all in favor of academical, academic and musical pursuits. And uh, Beth says, many people will cringe at some of the stories in, uh, recounted in the book and even think that it's almost borders on abuse. But others may agree with some of her methods since both of her daughters turned out to be both excellent musicians and students. And she says, I recommend reading it as a case study of extreme parenting with an ending that will make you smile. And I know that there is another book, and I didn't have time to get the name of it, also written by um, a Chinese-American parent who, I guess, is uh, written in response to, to, this one. to this one. But um, I know this, for a while, was in... I know I've seen that in a magazine yeah. somewhere. Okay. Written up see what else we have. Oh, Amanda, who is a works in our reference department, recommended a book called The City of Fallen Angels, which is actually part of a series of books, um, and the series is called The Mortal Instruments by Cassandra Clare, and this is a fantasy series, and it's an urban fantasy, and it's the story of Clary Fraze, the main character, who is searching, is on a quest, as you often are in fantasy novels, right, to find her missing mother, and she ends up in an alternative, alternative New York called Downworld, which is populated with fairies, warlocks, vampires, and werewolves. I don't know. Do you do you do any fantasy novel reading at all? I would say I've done all the Harry Potter books, okay. which started out as a read aloud thing to my youngest child. Okay. And then he got old, and I continued myself. Okay. And I enjoyed those very much. I've done the first Twilight book, and I've seen the movies. Yeah. I'm not as big into it as a lot of people are, mm -hmm. but I'm willing mm -hmm. to to try. Well, I'm, I don't know too much about this, although I think this is a very popular series. I think so, too. I think the book I'm recommending is actually number four in the series, and if you want to start at the very beginning, that is called City of Bones okay, by Cassandra Clare. That was from Amanda. Let's see who else we've got. Oh, and Pat De Gregorio, who does our homebound delivery and is also a very avid reader, too, uh, and very passionate about her reading, recommended a book called The Faith Club. A Muslim, a Christian, and a Jew, three women search for understanding. And this is, uh, these three women are from New York City, and they decided after 9-11 to get together to talk about their faiths. And as Pat said, it, this turned out to be a much more challenging uh, program than they anticipated because one of the things they had to face right off the bat was their own stereotypes about each other's belief system. And she said it took them a while to get past that starting point. But what happened after they started talking for a while, they found a deeper understanding of their own faith because somebody might challenge them, you know, why do you believe that? And then they had, then they suddenly realized they couldn't always explain. They, they knew it was something they were taught, but they didn't quite know from the heart what that, what that meant. <clears throat> One of the things I read, it said it took them, these three women, a full year of talking among themselves before they could share what they learned with either in their family or friends. It was such a powerful experience. So that is The Faith Club, A Muslim, A Christian, and A Jew, Three Women Search for Understanding. Do you read a lot of mysteries? I know you love The Scent of Rain and Lightning, which I was did. a mystery. I did. Um, I do like mysteries. Okay. And I always like a mystery that surprises me, mm -hmm. but has good relationships going on, or bad ones, whatever the case. Well, some are bad, for right. sure. Mm -hmm. But I always like when it ends happily somehow with some love thrown in. Okay. And the Sun of Rain and Lightning met all of my, plus being just a riveting story. So, well, Linda, I know Linda is a... Linda is our, again, part-time reference librarian, and Linda is the facilitator for our two, we have two mystery book clubs here at the Library of Day Club, and a group that meets in the evening, and she recommended, let me get out the little description that she sent me, 
uh, a new book, the fr and this is always good to have the first book in a series, right? Yes. And this is called No Going Back by Lyndon Stacy. And uh, Lyndon Stacy is a British mystery writer. And um, the story in this book is Daniel, the main character, his name is Daniel Whalen. He's left the police force. And then after that, his wife left him taking their young son. And now he's starting over as a delivery driver in Devon. And along with his retired police dog, Taz, he also assists with search and rescue work. And he eventually has to deal with his family problems, his reasons for leaving the police, a corrupt local officer, a vicious villain, and the treacherous bogs scattered across the Devon Moors. So that sounds like it could be an interesting read. And as I said, the first in a series, a brand new series. And then I brought two books um, that I have not read myself, but I wanted to recommend to our viewers. And we've talked about one of them anyway. Uh, yes. Yes, we have. And you know, I, it's interesting, so many of the books that we've talked about and that people recommended to me are books that are set in the sort of exotic or foreign locations. Mm -hmm. Or they're books where the location plays an integral part of, of the story. So and it's, it's, I find that so interesting in light of what our, our theme is for this summer. And there are two brand new books that have come out recently. Actually, one is hot off the press this week. Both of them set in Paris and one of them is fiction and one of them is nonfiction. So the first one is the fiction. This book has been out for a while and I brought a copy of it. This is a, the book on CD and this is called The Paris Wife by Paula McLean. And I know, you know, I've talked about the fact that this is getting a lot of that buzz. Yes, a word I've of mouth. seen that in multiple places. The Paris Wife is the mm -hmm. story of Ernest Hemingway and his first wife, Hadley. And um, they kind of married after a whirlwind courtship, and then they moved and spent five years in Paris in the 1920s in what, what they call the Jazz Age. And that was at a time when Paris was sort of a mecca for artists and, and writers. And um, it's actually, so it's a story of their relationship. And of course, at that time, Hemingway was spending time with other famous writers like F. Scott Fitzgerald and Gertrude Stein and Ezra Pound, James Joyce. So it must have been an exhilarating experience to be in Paris at that time with all of these very creative people. But the books were actually to told from the perspective of Hadley's view. Okay. of their relationship and this this book is interesting because there's now a whole category of novels out and they they are books about famous couples but all told from the perspective of the woman and very often that in these famous couples the man is the is the celebrity the well-known person in it but it's you know and we have a certain perspective but of course the wife has maybe yes. a totally different perspective so so that's The Paris Wife by Paula McLean. And then, brand new this week, da 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 da, <laughs> a book that I'm sure uh, many people will be interested in. And let me take the little sticky note off. This is David McCullough's newest book, The Greater Journey Americans in Paris. And so this is a nonfiction look. And interestingly enough, the same topic, in a sense, but at a different time period. And uh, McCullough is looking at Americans who spent time in Paris in the 19th century. And apparent, again, this was a time for many creative people, many writers and artists to uh, spend time in, in Paris. And he talks, he's going to talk about James Fenimore Cooper, well-known American writer, Samuel Morse, the inventor of the telegraph. There were a lot of artists. Elizabeth Blackwell was the first female doctor in the United States. Um, so, and there's, it's got great, great illustrations, and I, I thought it was kind of unique for McCullough, who often writes about American history, but set here in this country. Yes. So, this book, again, brand new, Greater Journey by David McCullough. So, and I want to, one more recommendation. We were talking about this before we began filming. This, if you like your armchair travel with a little bit of adventure, I think you're going to enjoy this book. And I mean, I'm gonna get all my stuff out of the <laughs> way. I'm gonna ask you to hold that. Sure. Thank you, Barbara. This <laughs> book uh, is called Lost in Shangri-La and it is by Mitchell Zukov. And I heard about this book uh, one day while I was driving in my car. 
and I got into the car, turned on the radio, and I got the middle of the interview. And I had to get out of the car before the end of the interview. So all I knew was what the story was about, but I had no title and no author. So I had to do some Googling. I had to put in some keywords, and I was able to get the name of the book and the author's name. And this is a true story. And I'm going to see, among all of my papers, <laughs> let me read the description of the, of the book to you. Near the end of World War II, a plane carrying 24 members of the United States military, including nine Women's Army Corps, or WAC members, crashed into the New Guinea jungle during a sightseeing excursion, which explains the Shangri-La, because they were trying to see a place that had been dubbed Shangri-La because it was so beautiful. So 21 men and women were killed. There were three survivors, a beautiful WAC, a young lieutenant who lost his twin brother in the crash, and a severely injured sergeant. They were stranded deep in a jungle valley notorious for its cannibalistic tribes. They had no food, no little water, and no way to contact the military base. It sounds like a great story. It does. It does. <laughs> this, is a, this is a book that I think has movie written all over it. Because it's, I mean, you listen to that and you think, who would have come up with that? But it was something that actually happened. So. Those are some brand new books that uh, I think people will enjoy reading. This one is in large print, too, that, uh, and it's not ready yet. It's brand new. It's just come in, just come out of the box, so to speak. So as you can see, we have reading in regular print, books on, on CD, large print, and I'm not even going to touch the digital stuff. I'm going to... No, there's just so many options. So, so many choices and options. Uh, before we finish up today, I'm going to take a couple minutes to talk about our courtyard, okay? <laughs> and um, our courtyard, we have a courtyard committee in the library, which I wasn't really aware of until pretty much a couple hours before we taped today. And the courtyard committee uh, worked very hard several weeks ago to renovate this area, which is sort of in the back of the building, but all to the side, to the back and to the side of the, of the municipal building where the library is located. So if you come in, normally come in the front, you must start coming in around the back, right? Because we have this lovely area. And as you can see, we're sitting under the umbrellas. Sun is shining, right? We're really lucky and there. We were lucky, we were lucky when we <laughs> planned this. <laughs> we were, we were. Like I said, if you have been coming in the front, sneak around the back. We have a ramp, you come on down and uh, spend some time back here in our lovely courtyard. So I want to, um, I want to thank Barbara for coming and spending time with, uh, with me today. As, as I said, we, we just continue the conversation that we do all the time, right? We, we do. And I could go on and on, but I won't. <laughs> well, if you need a book recommendation, you come into the library and you, you ask for Barbara. You're usually here in the afternoons, right? Yes, yes. And all day Saturday, too. And all day Saturday. All day oh, well, Saturday. that's great for our viewers. they got lots of opportunities. Yeah, and so. I, don't, I don't begin to know everything, but I do feel like if they tell me something they like, I can maybe steer them in a good direction or find somebody that can. So Well, I know. I count on you for that. So well, thank thanks. you for being a thank guest. You, thank you for having me, Mary. Oh, it's, I really it's appreciate truly it. been a pleasure. Just a reminder, Adult Summer Reading Program kicks off on Monday, June the 13th. So you can come in and register or register online. And then after that, you can uh, submit your entry for every book you either read or listen to. And that qualifies you for a weekly drawing. And then at the end of the summer reading program, we'll have the grand prize, which is still a mystery to me, to be honest. It's always good, though. It's always it's something, something really something great. something exciting. And all of your entries will qualify for the grand prize. So uh, and Miss Elaine <laughs> and I will be back next month. Thank you.
And you just don't know which way to turn. USA.gov. Find your social security benefits online. USA.gov. Our list of jobs will put you on cloud nine. USA.gov. Shop auctions for a used minivan anytime. USA.gov. 